afternoon. Now, this session finishes at 4.30. So, if you would both kindly introduce yourself for the record. I'm Jeremy Morgan. I'm Vice Chair of British in Europe, which is a coalition of groups across Europe. I'm a committee member of British in Italy. I'm Calva Meadows. I'm a committee member of British in Europe. I also coordinate the largest member group of British in Europe, which is a citizens' rights group based in France. Absolutely. Clause 5 of this bill could cheat. Um, we're the only representatives of British citizens in Europe, and we've heard various questions asked of other people who aren't British citizens in Europe, which we know the answers to. Could we ever so briefly start by answering those questions? Would that be completely contrary to everything this committee does? I think yes, yes, as long as you don't take too long, no, no. because colleagues will have. Lots of questions. So if, if you just briefly, yeah. It, it, it's not going to be a speech, but um, Professor Pierce touched on the point of the, the different rules that do apply across the EU 27 countries. Right. Um, there are some overarching EU rules that will apply even when we're no longer EU citizens, particularly one which covers people who've been resident for five years, and that is uh, across the board. Less than five years, you're subject effectively to national immigration rules with one or two uh, EU glosses. Um, in Italy, I think there are 25 different statuses that one can apply for at less than five years. In Germany, I think it's 180. Um, so it's an enormously complex mishmash which you have to try to fit yourself into. And certainly there will be people who don't. And if I can just give you one example of how the, the five-year system for long-term residents for what they're called third country nationals works. In Spain, the, sorry, the, 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 the rule re enables countries to ask for a minimum income and health insurance. In Spain, the minimum income that a pensioner has to produce is a little over €25,000 a year. Well, the UK state pension translated into euros at the moment is worth a little over €9,000. So people who, who are living in Spain, and they probably can manage some of them with difficulty on the state pension in Spain, um, are just never going to meet that, that limit. So that's a massive theoretical problem. Cabo will tell you a little bit more about the practical problems. Yeah, and that there are very great practical problems because going back to um, one of the things mentioned by a witness earlier, and that's the question of registration across the different EU27 countries. There are very different schemes in practice for British citizens living in the EU. Some countries, like my country, France, doesn't apply any kind of registration system at all for British citizens, EU citizens from another country living there. So we have between 150 and 200,000 British citizens living in France, only around 16% of whom have any form of registration at the moment. Other countries have a system of registering your residence, but nothing else. Other countries have greater systems where you register your residence and apply for a relevant card. So as you can see, there is already a huge difference between how people are treated across the countries. Come the 29th of March, if there's no deal, all of us will share one thing. We will overnight become third country nationals. Now, without any form of legislation in our host countries, we would become illegal, literally within a minute. We, all of our current rights would fall away. We are totally reliant on our host countries putting into place legislation that would stop that happening. So far, legislation has been very slow to arrive. My country, France, is, was the first to bring out legislation. Um, I want to say a little bit more about, later, about that later, I hope. But the, the issue is that we're going to have 26, because I'm excluding Ireland here for obvious reasons, we're going to have 26 different pieces of legislation operating in very different ways in very different countries. So there are going to be very big differences between people according to where they live. Um, using my country as an example, yes, we have a number of different cards for people who've been in residence for less than five years. Everybody who has been in, in residence in any EU country less than five years has to fit into national immigration law. Long-term residence status, which is mixed competence between EU and national law, doesn't come into effect until the five-year point. 
So that there is, there is a, as you can see, there is a big gap there. Um, everybody is going to be taking a different route to get there, and it is entirely possible that there will be large numbers of people who simply don't meet the conditions. And what of them? Well, thank you very much for making those points. Now we'll have the questions. Asa. Yes, and thank you for that. Uh, clause 5 of this bill grants the Secretary of State powers to modify, retain, direct EU legislations relating to social security coordination. What concerns do you have about these powers? Um, <clears throat> they're very open-ended, and to my mind they are um, unnecessary, certainly at this stage, because you have to recall in our paper we, we set out the, the legislative framework. Um, at present, the social security coordination rules of the EU apply in this country because we're still in the EU. Um, the 2018 Withdrawal Act preserves them as retained legislation um, after the, the 30th of March, if, if that is the date on which Brexit happens and there is no withdrawal agreement. Um, but in exercise of a regulation-making power under that Act, uh, the DWP has already put forward uh, a slightly amended version of the EU regulation to take account of the fact that there will no longer be uh, basically communication between the various countries. Um, so the, there is no need for any rush legislation on this. The existing law, which we're told it is the intention of the government to preserve, is in place. Um, this amended statutory instrument is in place. And the new regulations are simply there to make further changes, as yet unspecified, and no policy reasons for that are put forward in any of the supporting documentation. So it's unnecessary, very, very broad, and very, very worrying. And what concerns do you have about the changes the government has already introduced on Social Security through secondary legislation? Well, there are, you, you have to bear in mind that um, British in Europe are somewhat less affected by, by UK law for obvious reasons than the EU citizens living here of the, of the groups that are, that are affected by Brexit as, as citizens. Um, the, probably the most important aspect for UK citizens in the EU are those aspects of social security law which relate to healthcare, which in the EU is an aspect of social security, and to uh, <coughs> aggregation of pension contributions and exporting pensions. So I, as a, as a UK pensioner living in Italy, um, I'm entitled to receive my pension, but I'm also entitled under EU law to an annual increase. Um, there is a great concern that that might not continue, and the government has not committed to continue uprating our pensions beyond April of uh, 2020. So that is a huge worry, because although inflation is quite low, um, give it 10 years, the already very low British pension, it's the lowest pension in the OECD countries, um, and it's already been devalued by 20% because of the because of Sterling's fall. Um, not to increase that is really adding insult to injury to people who left this country on the basis that they would always get their up rating. What has been the effect on your rights as British citizens living in the EU of the uncertainty over rights of EU citizens in the UK? We share the uncertainty with them. Um, right now, we share even more uncertainty, and I'll, I'll tell you why, if I may. Um, because the rights of EU citizens haven't been enshrined in primary legislation, the national governments across the EU27 are very reticent to come forward with their own legislation because they are concerned that the rights of their nationals living in the UK will not be equally protected. In France, where we do have legislation now, it came out last week, it includes a clause that very clearly states that although it protects, to some degree, the right of British citizens in a no-deal Brexit, everything in that can be withdrawn by a decree if at any point the French government <coughs> considers that the, um, the British government is not treating French citizens in the UK fairly and equally. So although on the one hand you might say, yes, we, are, we have less 
uncertainty because we have that in place. On the other hand, it's not certainty because it can be withdrawn at any moment by a decree. And we're seeing that across the EU 27, that governments are reluctant to come forward with legislation because of the lack of enshrinement of EU citizens' rights in primary legislation. We're hearing it in our conversations with member states. We're, we're very, very aware that governments are holding back on coming forward with their protection for us. And that, obviously, you can imagine, that creates the most incredible level of uncertainty for people, because this is actually about people. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, to underline that, I mean, we're not talking about hearsay here. We have, as an organisation, been involved in negotiations with our national um, government, and with the EU Commission and MEPs. So we've, we've had fairly high level involvement, and we do know what they're thinking and saying. Okay. The government has said that they need the powers in Clause 5 to introduce as yet unspecified post-exit policy changes in Social Security. Do you think it's right that we grant powers to the government without knowing what they will do with them? I come back to the uncertainty. Um, talking of Clause 5, Social Security coordination, 80% of the British living in Europe are of working age or below. That's an awful lot of people potentially affected by any form of Social Security aggregation. And add to that, of course, the, the pension issues that Jeremy's already outlined. But, you know, we're talking over a million people who are affected by Social Security aggregation, the aggregation of, of the contributions they make to their retirement pension. That's a fundamental right that we all moved across the channel with. And the other, just to add to that, um, I just want to make the point that British citizens moving abroad are mobile. It's not so much that a British citizen moves from the UK to one country. We're mobile citizens. Many, many people have worked in three or four different countries. So that's a complicated aggregation scenario. And it is entirely possible because of the rules in individual countries about minimum contribution periods. So for example, in Italy, you have to contribute for 20 years before you can receive a pension. In, in the UK, as you know, it's 10. In France, it's 10, and so on. It's entirely possible that without coordination, yeah. people could work an entire working life and not receive a single state pension. Jack Brewitt. Thank you, Chair. You mentioned the, the variability that exists between how different countries in the EU are uh, treating those rights of British citizens living in the EU. Um, I'm going to ask you a similar question to I asked one of our witnesses earlier. Do you think that uh, different countries, the EU, Brit the uh, British government, have approached this from a different perspective uh, around those rights? Yes. I mean, clearly the British aim, insofar as we're talking about Britain versus 27 mm -hmm. or 26 different countries, uh, the, the British aim has been to get the withdrawal agreement through, to get Brexit and almost anything that has to be done in order to achieve that, uh, they will do. I mean, obviously, there are difficulties at the moment. Um, the other countries are more concerned with specific national issues very often. So I, I don't think you can... You can't really generalise, can you? I don't think you can. I, th I would agree with what you say there. The French are terribly concerned, for example, that people who aren't French citizens should not be involved in the public administration. In Italy, they're much more concerned about families. But that's the Italians and the French for you, you know. And do you think there has been a willingness to trade off some of those rights? <sighs> Very hard I to don't say. think it's so much of a trade off, but the fact that it, in each country you're coming out of an entire different culture. And the starting point is different. Um, the one thing they have in common is a desire to protect their citizens in the UK. That's a, that's a shared point of view. Stuart McDonald. I'm just following from that point. If, if I may, based on what you've said so far, what we should be doing is, first of all, encouraging the government to seek a ring-fenced agreement on citizens' rights. And the second thing we can do on this bill committee is to set out, on the face of a bill, um, strong rights for EU nationals in the UK, whether it's 
a, a no deal Brexit or a, a, a managed withdrawal, and then because of reciprocity, you will then see stronger rates for um, UK nationals across Europe. Yes. So that's our plan of action. Yes. Um, just, just in connection yeah. with ring fencing, we mustn't forget that the the UK has signed no deal deals with Switzerland and with the EEA countries. Yeah. So it's just extraordinary that they shouldn't be able to do the same thing with the EU. Sure. Um, could I also ask about um, what happens in different scenarios if UK nationals currently in Europe are wanting to come back to the UK with family members and how that might be affected by um, whether it's a, a deal or no deal situation and, and um, Yes, um, and thank you for asking that because it's a very important aspect that is causing a lot of concern. Um, you're talking about rights that are known as Surinder Singh rights. Um, this is the right that, um, let's say, a British citizen who has exercised freedom of movement by living elsewhere in the EU can then come back to the UK with their non-British family member. That right will disappear after Brexit, whether or not there is a deal. Um, so anybody wishing to bring back, let's say, that, that, let's say we're talking about somebody who is married to a Dutch citizen. Anybody wanting or needing to come back to the UK after Brexit would have to comply with EU, with UK immigration laws in order to come back. Surinder Singh rights will disappear after Brexit, whether or not there's a deal. So that means the full gamut of the £18,700? Absolutely. And what that leads to is a situation where, where people may be forced to make a choice between their family in their host country or their family in the UK. And very often what we're talking about here is people needing to come back to the UK to look after elderly parents. I can give you a very specific example very quickly. Um, let's call her Nikki. She lives in the Netherlands where she lives with and looks after her husband who has multiple sclerosis. In the UK she has parents in their 80s getting older who are going to need care and she's an only child. What does she do? She can't come back to the UK because there is no way, as a carer, she would earn the amount required in order to bring her husband. She can't bring two very elderly parents to the Netherlands where they don't speak Dutch. She's stuck. She has to make an impossible choice. Sure. Okay, that's definitely something we need to address. And then my final question then is, so speaking about trying, going about the business of trying to, to, to put the rights of EU citizens in the UK on the face of the bill, how do we go about doing that? Do we look to the withdrawal agreement? Do we look to Appendix EU of the immigration rules? Are there things that you'd want improved upon, even if we were just sort of transposing them into the legislation? I think we, we put the withdrawal agreement. That, that takes you an awful long way down the road. You put the withdrawal agreement uh, into primary legislation. Um, we're not entirely happy with the withdrawal agreement, but it's the best thing that's out there at the moment. Indeed, and the withdrawal agreement doesn't stop us going further. What, what is your unhappiness with? What, what it's it's actually more on the on the the rights we have in the EU. We have sure. lost our freedom of movement rights. Yeah, sure. So the, the people that Calva mentioned who move yeah. to Europe, not necessarily to the Netherlands or Luxembourg, um, have lost their right to move around. And so many of them move there precisely because it is a very mobile market. Sure. Um, people with IT skills, for example, do a, a two-year contract in one country and go to another. Um, th there are just so many British people who've taken advantage of that and made lives for themselves and ended up then, in the course of that, picking up a family from one of the countries they've stayed in. Um, it's become a very complex uh, system and actually taking that right away from them is, is very serious indeed. Okay. But it, it's not, if you like, the British um, who, who have, have it in their gift um, although there has been, there was at an early stage in the negotiations, I think in September 2017, uh, an offer by the British to give um, EU citizens in the UK indefinite right to return. So at present there's a five year, um, you, you're allowed to be away for five years with your settled status, then you lose it. Um, and the, the offer was make that a lifetime right to return in exchange for freedom of movement for UK citizens in the EU. That wasn't accepted by the EU at that time and hasn't, I think, been pushed as hard as it should. 
since because it's just a terribly sensible arrangement. Thank you very much. Minister. Uh, thank you very much for your evidence and for taking the time uh, to come and see us and set out your concerns so clearly. Do you think that this bill is the right place to put on, on the face of primary legislation, citizens' rights, or would that better be done in the withdrawal bill at the appropriate time? I think there's a timing issue in that the UK may leave the EU in six weeks with no deal. That doesn't leave very long to legalise, if you like, the rights of British citizens living abroad. If we know that EU 27 states are looking for legal guarantees for their own citizens living here, we don't have very long to do it. They're going to be looking for those in order to put in to place their own legislation. So I would have concerns about leaving it too long. And from the conversations that you've had to date with <coughs> officials, with your MEPs, etc., you believe it to be an absolute imperative that it be on the face of primary legislation and not something that's left through the, the secondary rules that have to date established the citizens' rights of the EU, of the three it, million here. It would make it an awful lot um, easier for them because they could say there is at least a law. I mean, the problem then, of course, is the law can be changed. <coughs> it still would look an awful lot better than... I mean, they know who Henry VIII was as well, and uh, they've seen the, the discussion... One of the things about EU um, officials and politicians is they're pretty tuned into what goes on uh, in this country, and they've seen the discussion, and it worries them. Thank you. I will just can I just add yes. very briefly that, that when I had this conversation, when when we met um, senior politicians and officials in France, they were not at all impressed at. Um, accepting that what is currently in place to cover settled status in the case of the no deal was in fact offering sufficient guarantee. We Thank have you. two ministers here, so I think we have questions from Minister Alex Sharma. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your, your submission. I know that uh, you've also talked to my officials on uh, some of the uh, amending SIs. Um, I just have one question, which is on pensions uprating, which you brought up. Um, what, what impact do you think uh, it would actually have on UK nationals. Have you talked to people extensively about this in terms of you know, potentially losing their, their uprating? It would it, be devastating. It, you took the so, words uh, so, out of my mouth. <laughs> well, so can I ask you, are you saying that it would actually change people's behaviour and as a result of that they might choose to move back to the UK? It would be devastating in that, um, number one, the, the UK pension, as, as Jeremy's already said, is already very low. Number two, it's been devalued by the loss in sterling. Many people are, are in the position of what you would call only just managing. Mm -hmm. so, 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 I mean, but just to answer the, if you would answer the, the direct question, which is that, do you think it would change people's behaviour where they decide as a result of that that they move back to the UK? It's not even as simple as that, because for many people, moving back to the UK is barely an option. Most people don't have links in the UK, they don't have housing in the UK, they have housing where they are, their lives are where they are. So it's so, not... So it wouldn't change behaviour, is what you're saying? It may well change behaviour, in that people would have no choice. Okay. But it's well, a very difficult thing to, to even contemplate. To move back to the UK. Well, if there are no further questions, colleagues, I do thank our two witnesses very much indeed for the evidence which you gave the committee. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for everything. So, colleagues.